It's Travel Michigan. I'm Dave Lorenz, along with Michelle Benash. And, you know, Michigan is so very well known for our, um, you know, natural areas. And uh, University of Michigan has a fantastic museum of natural history. We're going to learn a little bit about that next. Yeah, we're talking with Matthew Linke, the planetarium director at the U of M Museum of Natural History. And Matthew, just to start out with, folks may not know that um, Ann Arbor and, and the university has this Museum of Natural History as well as a planetarium. So tell us a little bit about those. Well, the museum uh, itself has been around, the museum building has been around for a very long time, built in 1928, and uh, we actually house a, a number of museums, uh, which are research museums, and then we, the Museum of Natural History, by name, uh, we're the, the, the public museum, if you can think of it that way. We were originally chartered to uh, exhibit the work of the research museums. Uh, and over the years, that mission has evolved a little bit. And uh, today we are, are a really great place to come to visit to see all sorts of things about natural history. So, so the museum's been around since when? The building itself was built in 1928. And the museum, in, in more or less in its present form, was chartered uh, in 1956 when the university reorganized things a bit. And then just recently we went under a very small name change to drop the word exhibit from our name, uh, which was a bit redundant. Um, and so today we now exist as the Museum of Natural History. And what are some of the things that folks can find when they visit the museum, some of the key collections or, or artifacts? Uh, the museum has actually several floors of exhibits which include, of course, dinosaurs, one of our, our big draws. Hmm. We have a, a very nice collection of dinosaurs on the museum's second floor hall of evolution, along with some 600 million years of other fossil life from the planet Earth. We have uh, our, our, the, um, our third floor area is the Michigan Wildlife, which includes taxidermy amounts of just about every bird that spends any time in the state at all. The fourth floor is sort of undergoing a lot of, a lot of change right now, but we have on the fourth floor uh, right now some, some simple geology mineral displays, a small anthropology area, and the back, uh, we call it the back 40. It's our traveling gallery, which at present um, has a health, net health and evolution exhibit. But in uh, the first of the year, this could become the uh, a whole new exhibit dealing with race. It'll be quite exciting. Also, the planetarium is on the fourth floor, so up there at the top, high in the sky, is our planetarium as well. Well, we're going to find out more about some of the activities happening at the planetarium in a second, but I just have to know, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the taxidermy, um, taxidermist-type exhibits of uh, Michigan um, animals, and there's some big question on whether you know wolverines were ever really here in Michigan. And, of course, you being at the U of M, you'd think you'd have a, a wolverine there, do you? We do not have a, we have a live wolverine, but there is a taxidermy mount wolverine. Um, and, yeah, I, I'm aware of that of that uh, controversy. I can't say I've ever seen one myself. But, again, over time, a lot has changed in the state. Yeah. And, of course, you, you talk about history anyway there. So exactly. who knows? Maybe there were there <laughs> at one time. But um, it's good to hear. So University of Michigan Museum of Natural History, uh, you are the planetarium director. And I know you, you do some really cool things there at the planetarium. One is a uh, family Halloween party that we want to learn about in a minute. But first, tell us about that planetarium and the type of uh, programs that, that, that you have developed and have available for people. Well, the planetarium was first installed in 1958 and has undergone a number of renovations. Most recently, in 2007, we converted to what's called Full Dome Digital, and state-of-the-art technology for planetariums, or planetaria, I could say it that way, too. Uh, and as such, we work with audiences that include the general public, school groups, some university groups. Uh, we do birthday parties. We've had a number of different kinds of events in the planetarium. And as you might expect, a planetarium uh, is going to cover lots of astronomy. So one of our most popular programs uh, are uh, include the, the night sky discussions, live talks with our student operators who present the bright stars, constellations, and planets of that particular night. We also run what are called full dome movies. We're not a movie theater, but we use the technology to immerse the audience in environments that they can't really experience otherwise. We can take them through a black hole or through a wormhole or out to the edge of the universe and back. Uh, as well as the current night sky. And these full dome movies range in topics from astronomy to biology uh, to evolution. Uh, depends on what we're running at that particular time. We have a great program coming up in November called Season of Light, which uh, is sort of a holiday show in that it looks at the origins of many of our solstice traditions, those that happen during the time when the sun is low and the moon is high and the days are short. Marvelous program with great music, excellent narration. It's always a popular show. 
Well, I've seen movies on IMAX. I think a lot of people have, but I I've never seen a movie in a planetarium. Is it is the movie literally on the entire surface uh, of the um, you know the ceiling planetarium? Yes, it is. Wow. It's, it's really quite an experience. It, it creates this great illusion of depth. And when we fly through things, we're flying through the star fields, uh, it, it's really quite an amazing feeling. We're always a little bit careful because sometimes people react to these motions in certain ways, so we sometimes have a little bit of a caution. Um, but it, it really is quite an experience. It's a lot of fun. Uh, people often are surprised when the lights come up and the operator maybe stand there holding on to a, a rumble pad to game pad in the hand, which is how we often fly the, universe, or fly the, the software or fly the computer uh, during live presentations. Uh, but it's, it takes you everywhere that we have data for, and we travel from literally the edge of the universe as we know it back down to the surface of the Earth and everything in between. And it's, it's visually very fascinating. Well, what a great way to get young kids yeah, kind of interested in science. Oh, yeah. I can't imagine, actually, a better way. No, we just started to see these little light bulbs come on because, uh, and, and remember, I, I was 30, 30 some years in what's called auto mechanical, the, the nature of the technology before digital came along. So I was a, a kind of a hard fought convert to digital, but it's remarkable in what you can teach with digital. And we watched the light bulbs come on as people suddenly realized that, oh, that's why the sun rises and sets, mm. and that's why the sky changes with the seasons. It just offers a whole new level. Uh, to teaching, which has really changed how we teach. Sounds like a really cool place to visit. And of course, maybe never a better place to visit than right now. You are um, having a, a pretty cool thing. You're having your annual family Halloween party. And uh, as the name uh, uh, seems to indicate, uh, it sounds like this is something for the whole family. Exactly. This, I believe, is the 15th year. I think we, time flies. So we, we've done this now. This will be on Sunday the 28th from 12 to 5 p.m. It's a free event, and uh, children and adults, actually, are welcome to wear costumes, and, and both do. It's amazing uh, the extent that some adults go to to dress up for this event. <laughs> it's just a lot of fun. The museum is just basically a great big trick-or-treat place. We have a number of different stations with activities and fun things to do. The plant tree is doing this normal thing. Uh, it, it just It's a chance to, to be indoors or what the weather is like to trick-or-treat among the dinosaurs, and it, it's just a lot of fun. It's one of our larger events. It's always a, it's an action-packed five hours of time with, uh, oh, some years uh, over 2,000 people, depending you know, on the weather. Um, but it, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work for the staff, and the museum store manager, Kelly Sullivan, deserves a lot of credit for, for managing all this every year and taking it on. And I think just about everybody who works for us works that day to make sure it all goes smoothly. Well, I think trick-or-treating with the dinosaurs seems like every kid's like <laughs> yeah. wildest dream come true. Yeah, and they don't actually, the dinosaurs don't eat anything that day. They're just sitting there. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's a unique environment. Uh, it's a chance to explore the museum. A lot of people who are there are there for the first time. Uh, our student staff, we rely heavily on undergraduate and graduate students to work our programs. They also dress up, and they have among themselves a little competition for costumery. It, it's, it's just fun, though, to, to see... You know, four dozen Harry Potters and a couple dozen ghouls and a couple, you know, just every imaginable costume that you can, it just, just shows up at the museum, and both adult and children, it's just a lot of fun. does sound like a lot of fun. I'm sure you're going to have a, a great deal of fun on the 28th. best thing about this, even up above uh, all the fun, is that it's free. Absolutely. And it's uh, happening on the 28th at the uh, University of Michigan Museum of Natural History. I want to thank Matthew Linke, the Planetarium Director, for joining us today. And for more information, just go to UMM. NH.org, University of Michigan Museum of Natural History, and you'll find it all there. Of course, lots of other events happening in the state. Michelle? Absolutely. Country music fans are going to want to head up to Kuwait and Casino in Sault Ste. Marie for the Band Perry concert on October 25th. And book lovers, which I think are bibliophiles, um, will be heading to, uh, should head to the Michigan International Books Festival October 26th through 28th at Laurel Park Place in Livonia. Um, and, you know, obviously Halloween is just around the corner, so folks can head to Pentwater October 26th through 28th for the spooktacular weekend and parade with a teen Halloween costume party, Halloween on the green, uh, parade, trick-or-treating, all of that fun. Or they can head to Jackson for the JSO Halloween Spooktacular October 27th. Um, you've got the Legend of Sleepy Howl at Historic Downtown Howl. 
This 10th annual event is happening October 27th with 20 trick-or-treat stations, live music, costume contests, all of the fun things you would find. And for something a little different, the Steam Railroading Institute in Owasso is having treats and trains on October 27th. Mm. Um, we've got Urban Hay Day in Hudsonville, October 27th. This is the first time they're having this event, and they'll have a hayride as well as a bus to take you on a tour of Hudsonville. And many 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 more events mm-hmm. halloween and otherwise that you can find at michigan.org so a bibliophile if you like books so if you're a carpenter i hope that's what that means or, so if you're a carpenter are you a nail file <laughs> i know i know <laughs> don't give up the day job well speaking of uh i don't know hey we're gonna we're gonna find out about booze brews and brats it's a big event manistee coming up soon that's coming up right here on travel michigan where your trip begins at michigan.org